Hi everyone, Sane Man here. A while back I had an opportunity to get onto a live stream with Coach Greg Adams. I put it up for you guys, so enjoy. But before I get to it, let me first tell everyone about today's sponsor, the MGTOW Book Collection. Tim Patton has written five MGTOW books. MGTOW is forever is the latest and is a great introduction to MGTOW. If you've been injured on the job and need help, disabled and unable to work is for you. MGTOW Building Wealth and Power helps you empower your finances. Masculinity is our future is about how the world sees masculinity as toxic and what it means to be a man. Finally, MGTOW Why I Cheat. When a woman named Marcia read this book, she wanted to scream out loud, Why is MGTOW a real thing? Thanks for pushing her buttons, Tim. All five books can be found at the sponsor link down below. Anyways, now on to our chat, so enjoy. What's going on, everybody? It is Coach Greg Adams back in here with another YouTube live stream. Shout out to the Coach Gang for being in here, being involved, and being active here on this YouTube channel. Let me take this down. I'm running from another screen real quick, and I hope the Coach Gang can hear me. I can't even get my uh, sound check in here, but shout out to the coach gang and shout out to all the guys that are in the free agent lifestyle. Yes. And it sounds like we're ready to go. Guys, listen, I've made started making content two years ago. All right. Two years ago. And as you know, before then, I was consuming content left and right. All right. Before I even started. And if you would have told me in two year period that I would have had alpha male strategies that I would have had Donovan Sharp, that I would have had the likes of Dr. B.O.A. here. If you would have told me two years ago that I would be in this position today interviewing who I'm interviewing today, I would have told you you were a flat out liar. All right. That's what I would have told you. Unfortunately. All right. I'm not lying to you. I got one of the legends. All right. If you were creating a Mount Rushmore of legends here, I got one of the legends of MGTOW. I got one of the legends of the Red Pill. Most of you guys have been exposed to this individual for quite a long time. He might have been your introduction into MGTOW, as certainly he was for me. He was one of the first voices that I heard when I was going through my divorce, when I was going through searching for answers. And it is none other than legendary Sandman MGTOW. Shout out to Sandman MGTOW. We're going to go ahead and bring him in and join us. What's going on, brother? Nothing much. Um, just one quick uh, thing before we start. Um, now the speakers are back, so I can hear you through my speaker, but I can't hear you through my headphones. So I don't okay. know what changed. Is okay. it, do you think it's something changed on your end, or um, what do you think? Um, I'm not sure. Is it interfering with you, or are you getting a double feedback? Well, I'm not getting any feedback. I mean, if you're okay talking like this and it sounds good, then yeah. I'm good to go. As I, far just, as I know it sounds good, but I'm going to see what the guys say in the live chat, if they're seeing or experiencing okay. any feedback. Um, we had a little bit of technical difficulty. So as you can see, we were a little bit delayed here, but uh, we're going to go ahead and go forward. And if they tell us that there's some feedback issues, then Got we'll try to adjust. All right. How's that sound? That sounds good. All right. Sounds good, man. Good to have you here. Everybody's saying that it's very clear. Your mic sounds amazing. All right. Good to have you here. You're one of the only people that I said I would interview without you showing your face and revealing who you are. All right. So a lot of times I like to have a good live person on the other side. But of course, Sandman gets an exception right here. So welcome to Thursday afternoon red pills. This is our normal time. And look, how many people do you think you have influenced? I know you don't have your um, subscriber count on. OK, but how many people do you think you uh, uh, can you imagine have you influenced here for men going their own way for the red pill manosphere how many people do you think you've influenced I, I wouldn't count it in terms of how many people i've influenced in terms of like introduced to the red pill i count it in terms of how many people i've inspired to create their own channels mm -hmm. and i think there's probably five to ten big content producers that i've helped you know to get started because they saw what i originally did in terms of spreading the message and then they started getting into it as well and yeah. that and then that kind of multiplies out so it's like a ripple effect you know you throw one stone and you get 10 rings and then those 10 rings get 10 rings and it just keeps going exactly and one of the things that i would say for me uh when when i heard all of your content it wasn't necessarily an inspiration to create all right that came later but i think the inspiration was you just revealing a lot of things and putting it in proper perspective in order for men to understand 
what we've been going through, right? So you've influenced content creators, but you've also influenced the sector of men who haven't been able to verbalize exactly what female nature is, who haven't been able to verbalize what hypergamy is. I mean, you were one of the main voices. So, uh, you know, I know a little bit of your story, but say there is a guy, let's just say there's a guy right now that doesn't know what, who were your influences when you started your content creator uh, creation? Well, when I was, when I was getting into this, it was the summer of 2013 and I was yeah. looking at um, a lot of the men's rights channels. So Karen Strawn, Paul Elam. Yeah. And then from the MGTOW perspective, I saw uh, Barbarossa and I saw Stardusk. And at the time, Spetsnaz, he just started around the same time that I did. Yeah. So those are the, those are the main influences. And as I, as I started getting into it more and more, you know, I, I, I didn't know if I was an MRA or I didn't know if I was a MGTOW. So I kind of was involved in both camps at the beginning. Yep. And then I realized, well, the MRA, they make a lot of valid points just like MGTOW, but their plan of action doesn't really go anywhere. Right. So the, the MGTOW think course was probably set for me in the middle of 2014 towards the okay. end of 2014. I was, I was, I completely, you know, put my hat in that camp as I saw the MRA start to decline. OK. And I mean, you know, there there may be some guys who are really old school MGTOW. I say you're the first wave. OK. I mean, you're you're the first wave of guys that people remember that are still around. Uh, was it really labeled MGTOW at the time that you, you know, kind of got in there? I mean, there was a small label, but was it really a bigger group as it is today? Well, it was MGTOW. It was just um, you're looking at, you know, Stardust Barbarossa. They they pretty much laid the groundwork for everything. And when they, when I got in, I was in, I would say I was in the second wave of that first wave. So there was, okay. uh, after that it was Spetsnaz and myself, but Barbarossa and Stardust, they started fading away. They, they stopped producing as much content. Um, yeah. you, you know, the, the MRA even started fading away towards the middle to end of 2014. It slowly started to go down. So I think I kind of kept it going and, and brought in a, audience big enough so that it so the new content creators could start up that's and right it could be an audience that was big enough and there would be enough revenue there to sustain it going forward right and i mean i i think that's one of the bigger legacies of of my work it was just to kind of show people hey you can you can not only spread this information but you can also do it and and kind of cover your costs and make a little bit extra right so that, can, so that you can afford to keep doing this and, you know, you could do it full time, you know, like because right. when I started it, it, it didn't really make sense to do it full time. And I it took a couple of years for it to kind of make sense. Right. And yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I but, don't know but on, on that note, because a lot of guys still kind of have that philosophy of, you know, it, it shouldn't be a, a way to generate revenue. Right. Some people say, well, it's not to be sold. And some people say, hey, listen, in order for me to do it effectively, I must sell it. Right. You took the approach of, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it enough where um, I can earn a little bit of revenue from it to continue to do it effectively. Did that rub people the wrong way early on when you, oh, yeah. Yeah. But the thing is it was, it wasn't like a lot of the revenue, like in terms of PayPal donations for topics, like I didn't really know where to take this in the beginning. Cause like, I kind of just covered hypergamy and brief faults law. And I, I covered, you know, gaslighting and nice girls. And, you know, I covered yeah. all the very, very typical topics. And then people started asking me, they sent me a uh, question said, look, I'll send you PayPal money on PayPal. If you cover this topic. And I'm like, okay. Like right. I, I was kind of shocked by that. So I said, sure. And then four days later I got a message saying, did you get my money? You know? And, and, and I was like, really money? What? Like I didn't even <laughs> check my PayPal account. And then I looked in the PayPal account. And there were three or four people who had basically said, here are my, donations here are my requests and i was kind of like wow like I, I i didn't realize that that was a thing right and so at that point i started to try to fill every single video with uh with somebody's interactive comment that they would bring in yeah and i found that that's really where uh, things started to take off when i started to share people's personal stories and my own personal stories yep. i think that's that's what people want to hear they don't necessarily want to hear all the you know pseudoscientific mumbo jumbo they want to hear right stories about humans interacting with other humans. Mm -hmm. So for you, it's a, it's a niche. It's, you have a, you have a classic style. Everybody kind of knows 
uh, you you run scripts. So when you run your scripts, it sounds people say you sound like a robot, right? And people yeah. are like, are you AI or you know some sort of uh, CIA intelligent agent or whatever people <laughs> can come up with? Uh, you have a classic style, so you run a scripted uh, program, and it, like you said, it came from less of a science uh, approach to, or more uh, less of an archaeologist type of approach, more to a realistic uh, style. Well, in the That's beginning, a, in, in yeah, 2013, when I probably produced my first 30 or 40 videos, it was more of that like historic scientific approach. Yeah, I, I found that I would run out of material pretty quickly. Right. So it wasn't until the end of January 2014 that I decided, okay, I'm going to do this daily. See if, see what happens. Yeah. And I, I thought I was crazy at the time because when I started, it was, you know, within a few months I was like, I was burning out. I didn't yeah. really know how to streamline the process and get things done, you know, pretty quickly. So every day I would, you know, script the whole thing and, you know, it's just, I'm still doing it today, but it's just, it's, it's a lot easier than it was back then because I kind of right. know exactly what to do. So and, yeah, you got your method down a little bit. So if there's a new content creator that you, that you think that you would aspire today, what would you tell them about getting into just content creation in general, or if they wanted to get into the manosphere content, uh, like, what would you tell them? How much time do you spend? What should they do if they wanted to make content? Well, there's a couple different approaches. Like I know, um, I don't know if you've heard of Think Before You Sleep. Yep. Uh, I I gave him his start. Like I promoted his channel on my channel yeah. back in, I don't know if it was like a year or two ago. And now look at this. He's he's massive. He's just- He passed me. I mean, I was like, dang, you know, so it's good though. I mean, and I, and I often said that a lot of guys won't uh, get a rise if you stay behind the camera. Right. I was like, ah, n nobody's going to really do that anymore. Sandman kind of kind of adopted that side. But I was wrong because he's actually effective. Well, I told him, you know, why don't you just script your videos? And he and he realized when you script the video, you get you can you can flush out the ideas a lot more and you can actually create content that people people will just, you know, it's well thought out. It's well put together. So people will go through with it. But the problem is if you want to do really, really high end quality scripted content, you know, I do it daily. So sometimes I slip up a bit here and there, but if you really want to do high end quality content, you're going to have to script only one or two videos a week. Now mm. that's okay. Considering wow. that if the video is really, really good, you can get hundred, 200, 300,000 views. So that ahead. makes up for the, for the lack of daily content production. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, actually, that's a good point because I don't script anything, but I'm more of just a spontaneous talker. I do more impromptu style. And that's funny, though. Everybody has a style. Like yeah. some people read articles. Some people are, you know, talkers. Some people crap talk. Some people script. I mean, every but that's the good thing about our niche. Yeah, no, it, uh, like everybody has, you know, their own their own. Yeah, like you said, style. So I, I don't. I don't think anyone's really ripping anyone else off. And I, the times I've seen other people try to rip other people off, it's never really worked. Right. <laughs> you know, they would try right. it. I've seen people try the whole donation style video where they would take a donation and they would cover it, you know, and I've seen it yeah. fail fantastically. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I'm like, well, you know, I guess it's not working for you, but it's still working for me. So yeah. Well, you were the one you laid the foundation for a lot of that stuff, because eventually I did like, a, OK, send me a donation. And people did it uh, a few. But I find it, I found it bothersome to my preparation. Right? I was like, all right, I, I really don't want to talk about that. But you sent in the donation. Right. So then then it it just didn't work for my style. So I just got rid of it. So uh, but but that's good. I think you laid quite a bit of a foundation for guys. Uh, that want to create content. So look, Sandman, you said you've been in it since 2014 for the most part. That's six years. Um, you've influenced probably millions of guys. I've been in it for two years and I kind of had a big skyrocket uh, to the position that I am. And now look at me. I'm interviewing Sandman. I mean, so for guys that are wanting to do this, anything can happen if you apply, though. And I think for most guys, you got to apply it the daily way. And I got the daily way from Sandman, to be honest with you. I mean, you inspired me to do that. Well, it, before I started doing daily content, nobody else was doing daily MGTOW content. Like it just right. it didn't it didn't happen. And then you know it, it's it started picking up when um, when it, you know, all the all the channels were monetized and you know it was growing pretty quickly. 
a lot of content producers, they started doing daily content in terms of like clips. They would cl get, you know, mm -hmm. cl clips of various bad behaviors and things and they would put them together and oh i see oh yes 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 we did see the the rise of that that was kind of something that came along let me do this i'm going to read some super chats and then we'll go to the next sure. uh topic it kind of uh, cognito thought leader says i'm a financial advisor by trade the down market has given you an opportunity my advice to 55 plus males uh love her from afar no great divorce hashtag true shout out to you caitlin ferguson says patrick mahomes didn't listen coach he's now engaged yes he is uh, to his high school sweetheart. We'll see how it turns out for him. He didn't listen, but it may work out. It may not. Hope he signed a prenup. Drill Boston says, Sam Man and CGA Red Pill community continues to grow. You both are lifesavers. Please don't stop what you're doing. Some young, some young men right now need you. Shout out to you. Thank you for the original Coach Gang member. Beyond the Pale says, Sam Man, welcome to the Coach Gang. Appreciate you, bro. Bad bro says, Sam Man, as a guest on the show, Great choice, coach. It wasn't the choice, all right? I mean, I didn't have a choice. I got to get Sandman in here. My man, the work, the working man says, great collaboration. Sandman is a legend in our community. Greetings from Germany, coach gang. Let me do a couple more. Kuhlman, Kuhlman says, Sandman didn't do that interview with Dr. McGraw. He said, don't do it, all right? But we're going to get to that a little bit later. We're going to get to that a little bit later. Hang tight. The Price is Right review says, two of my favorite MGTO bros on one stream. Stay awesome. All right. I'm going to catch up to you guys uh, in a minute. We got Sandman on, so we want to hear his voice. And let's talk about this. Bella Thorne. Bella Thorne recently got on. Everybody knows the story. A lot of content creators have been talking about it. She got on OnlyFans. She made $2, $2 million in two days and then created a little bit of controversy as OnlyFans had to try to issue refunds to men who were disappointed in her product. All right. She didn't live up to expectations. And then it further hurt what they call other sex workers, because now they couldn't charge as much because OnlyFans is now caught up in this refund policy right now. And so my question to you, did uh, Bella Thorne expose herself in this situation because now she's saying she's doing it for an acting role or did she expose the simps? When when did she say she's doing it for an acting role? Was this that is something that I heard from another video that they basically had a uh, um, a screenshot of a social media post basically saying, hey, I might be doing this for uh, research for an acting role. Well, she, I've got quotes from her in my video. It's called Bella Thorne, the Simp Slayer. Okay. And uh, mm. she's, she basically said she was doing it to help sex workers and reduce the stigma associated with sex work. Okay. And, you know, she, she directed a, a porn film uh, a while back. So, you know, she's not shy from that community, but, but the thing is, if you look at, if you look at what she's done, she's literally destroyed the, the, she's doing, she's done the opposite of what she said she was going to do. Right. And, you know, and she's going to have to give back most of that money because she promised one nude photo and it, and it never happened. But if you look mm -hmm. on her Instagram, there are strategically covered nude photos so mm -hmm. why didn't she just do, you know, take one of these strategically covered photos and put it up on, on, on there? It's, she'd be, still be nude. You just wouldn't see anything, right? You wouldn't see all any of the naughty bits. So I don't, I don't know. I, I think she's just, she's doing a lot of stuff right now during, during the coof for attention. Right. Like she, I think she's, uh, did she get married or engaged? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. and there's like a whole yeah, bunch of, sure. it's like she sold her pink house for $2.5 million dollars. Maybe mm -hmm. she needed the money for that house. Maybe she, mm -hmm. you know, she was in over her head. Maybe the right. acting roles aren't coming in. Right. I don't know. There, there could be. There's so many things. So many motivations for behind for what she could have done. We right. just don't know. Well, it would seem like it was out of nowhere, but I, I never knew who Bella Thorne was, and but only if you would have said the girl that was on the Disney TV program that I that I was aware of because of the other actress, but, um, but. But beyond that, I never knew who she was, but I guess she was already doing something similar, if I'm not mistaken, or at least on Instagram promoting herself similarly, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure. Well, she's got 22 or 24 million subscribers on Instagram followers. Like that's- Well, what did she do? I mean, was she just the Instagram kind of thought or was she an activist? No, like no, it's mostly just sexy photos by the pool wearing- you know, orange bikinis and okay. you, know, so, you know, expensive products. So she's, she's definitely doing the whole product placement kind of mm -hmm. thing. You know, th that's, that's for sure. So she, she probably so just, this was the next step. 
Well, she saw this as a as a way to make some extra cash. Like, I mean, if if you could put up a photo or say you're going to put up a photo and make two million dollars, I mean, you'd probably do it too, right? You know, you I would do it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'll be up there doing it myself. Yeah, exactly. So she right. she she did this, but I, I think this is a bigger trend. I think the you know you get Hollywood starlets and then you get these OnlyFans girls and the, like the Hollywood starlets are not getting any attention right now. Right. Because the movie industry shut down. All the premieres are do- are done, so they need attention. But they see that the only fan girls are still getting attention, so that they're trying their hand in that as well. So Cardi B also went on um, OnlyFans, and she also promoted herself on there. One of her b- behind the scenes photo shoots for one of her new songs. So you're starting to see the mainstream women going into OnlyFans and trying to like take it over. I think this this is the beginning of something like a trend. Where yeah. you can see more and more women go over there. I mean, imagine if you're a washed up, you know, let's say you're a washed up 30 year old star actress who can't get any more work. And then you say, well, you know what? I'm going to post nudes right. on OnlyFans and I'm going to post a series of them and they're full nudes. And you can make five to $10 million if you did right. like five or 10 photo shoots. Your movie career is already done. Yeah. So instead of going to Playboy, which doesn't really technically exist anymore, to make money like you know stars used to do in the past, yeah. all you have to do is go on OnlyFans, post your nude photos, collect your ten million dollars. There's your pension, right? I, I mean, that's more than any money you'd make on a movie role. And so you could use, you know, you could use the movie industry as a means, you know, early Hollywood success as a means to make even more money in the adult in the content baggage. business. So, but I guess women have been doing this for the most part since, like you said, they've been doing this before. They go to Playboy eventually, and then they get some, you know, ability to promote themselves another way. This so, is just OnlyFans is just the newest way to be able to expose this. But we've seen the opposite. We've seen adult actresses trying to move into mainstream film. But now right. I think we're going to see the opposite trend, which is mainstream actresses moving into right. adult content. And I, I think the adult content is going to be more lucrative than the the hollywood stuff so and it's more acceptable right now i mean it's an acceptable thing to do for women to expose themselves like like yeah they want this only fans is making it uh socially acceptable for this to happen so right. so i you know in the next five to ten years you're going to see you know the thoughtery just get out of hand you know right. it, it, there's another topic that we might want to briefly or we might Go even go deeper it's uh it's a topic of the incel community rising up because there's okay. Uh, I think that that's really the next evolution of the red pill in terms of, well, it's the black pill technically, but okay. I think it's, it's really, it's really starting to to blow up in terms of, um, I don't know if you've seen the documentary from Insomatics. No. He put out a documentary in it uh, about it. And it's, it, it, it's fantastic in terms of it showing the discrepancy in younger generations in terms of the dating market. You're seeing that right. 50% of young men are not getting any dates at all. Right. You know, and being virgins into their thirties. So that's mm. really going to start to change society, and, and that's only really begun in the last you know few years. And I think us older guys, we're not really aware of the same of these dynamics that are happening because we've been out of the dating market for a really really long time. Right. So, right. yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Well, one of the things that there's some young guys that are putting out content now, and they're telling us that the eighty twenty rule, as we talked about it, is more ninety ten now. I've heard um, 95 five from these 95 five. All right. So depending on who you are, right. And I'm, I can, I can vouch for 50% of guys probably get zero action these days. Yeah. I mean, what's, what's the effect of that? What's the effect of that long term? Well, psychologically it's, it's going to have a massive impact on these people or these guys. And what's going to happen is they're going to go into society and they're going to destabilize it. The, 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 this guy named first over at Insulmatics, he believes that, the rioting that's happening in the United States right now it has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, the coof is keeping people apart in terms of the bedroom. So you're, you're seeing a lot of frustrated young men who have to get their energy out. And, you know, before they would have gotten married, they would have had a relationship. They would have used that sexual energy in a constructive way to build right. a society. Now they're using that energy in a destructive way. And so they're burning down their cities because they're frustrated, right? There's that line, you know, a child that's not embraced by the village will burn the village down to feel its warmth. So we're mm-hmm. seeing. <laughs> wow, that's big. That's big time. Well, it's true, right? So that's true. Yeah. If that's you're true. giving, I'm seeing that. 
if you're going to create half your society and make them incels and you're going to take take away their warmth in the bedroom then they're going to go around burning everybody's bedrooms down because wow. they're going to be so frustrated so wow. I, I think that that's that's really where this is heading and and i think it, it's dating apps that are massively responsible for it okay but i also think it's the fact that social media is there and it's and we're not we're gonna have to regulate these things at some point like it, it and not regulate them in terms of free speech but regulate them in terms of um we might have to limit people's ability to use dating apps because it's going to destabilize society. Right. We're not, we're, we're still not aware of the long-term effects of these new technologies. And it's normally the case. We actually go forward with things. We see how they turn out. I think ultimately men will be blamed. That's where the blame will be laid because we can't economically support ourselves. But you're saying they, the men will destabilize themselves because they just don't have a chance at it at hell on some of these sites or interacting with the, just the, just the 49er itself. They can't even interact with her because there's a guy who's an eight that will go see her. So uh, long to, and for me, incel, it, it tends to get a dirty, dirty word. I don't know much about the community in order to speak on it properly. I know there's probably incels that watch both of our content. They probably watch PUA content for the most part. So for the most part, let's say let's say I was a guy who wanted to know genuinely and not use it as a shaming word. What would I need to know about incels? Like, do you have any idea? What would I need to know about them to hear their side of the story? Well, they they don't want to be incels. That, that's the that's the they don't want to be. Well, I've always I've always promoted the idea that, you know, for you to go your own way, right. you have to go your own way from something, which means you have to have dates. You have to go through relationships. You have right. to gain that experience. You can't. You can't just go your own way from something that you've never right. <laughs> experienced. Got it. So they can't go their own way because they've already. They don't have a chance. Yeah. yeah. So, but they want to. They want to go out on, on dates. They want to have relationships. They want to do these things while they're in their late teens, early twenties. And then I, I, I'm I'm suspecting that with the red pill knowledge and the black pill knowledge that they gain, that they they'll reach the same conclusions that a lot of the, the, the red pill guys in, in, in the MGTOW community have reached a long time ago. It, right. They just need right. to go through those experiences. So they haven't gone through the ringer yet. They want to no. go through it, but they just haven't. They Okay, I get it. That, but, makes, that makes a lot of sense. That but I think, there's, sense. I think there's something more insidious going on here. I don't know if it's conscious or subconscious or if it's intentional. I don't know. But okay. you know, you get the PUA guys. You know, you get the, the guys of the, the boomer generation and the late – uh, later generation X guys. Yeah. And, uh, they, they went, they went through, you know, stable relationships. They might've gotten divorced, you know, but they, they still had love and, and, and dating and relationships in a traditional sense. Yeah. And then, and then my, the people in my generation, like the, 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 you know, the v millennial slash gen X, like the cusp and then the yep. millennials for the most part, we went through relationships, but we got bad relationships. So, right. We, we, we said, you know what? This is not for us. Yeah. But these new guys, they're going through and they're not getting anything. Mm -hmm. So so the, 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 I think that MGTOW is kind of like this sweet spot where men got burned, but they didn't get burned too much. Right. So we became aware. But, it, but I think that incels, they're not getting enough. And the PUAs all got a lot. And so the PUAs want to continue – they want to reform the law so they can continue to get female validation. Mm -hmm. And I think the incels are also seeking out female validation as well. But the MGTOW f uh, community is different because we don't want female validation. Right. So my thinking is that women saw this. I don't know if they saw it consciously, subconsciously, if it was planned or not. I don't know. But I think they saw this and they said, you know what? We, tr we gave the boomers the, the carrot. We gave them sex as a carrot. So yep. with the incels, we're going to give them the stick. We're going to control them by not giving them sex at all. Mm -hmm. So you can, as a woman, you can control a man by giving him sex on a regular basis, or you can control him and make him thirsty, a uh, die of thirst, and then you can control him that way. Right. But so I think that the, the MGTOWs, we, you know, we kind of got through this situation where we, we got, we got the carrot, but it was, it didn't taste very good, but we yeah. still got the carrot, but the incels are getting the stick and they don't know what to do. So they're thirsty and they're, they're looking for ways to get that female validation. So if in a sense, if, if we can put it in perspective for men like us that said, oh man, that didn't taste too good. Well, how do we sound to an incel if we say, well, 
we got it. It didn't taste good. Don't try to get it, right? Like, well, that's they, basically what we sound to them. And they're going, wait a minute. Well, at, least right? at, least, at least give me a chance to get it. Right? Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and you know, I, and that, that's the thing I say, go out and get it, but you know, get it when you're in your late teens and early twenties, because that's when it's the least dangerous because you're not getting married. You're not being, you know, pushed into having kids at that age. You know, yeah. the financial obligations aren't there. So it's, it's the best time to do it. Women are never better than their looks wise, personality wise, right. emotional damage wise, baggage wise at that point. So if you can get it at that point, then you can, then you don't feel like you're missing out on anything when you get older. But the problem is they're they're not getting it. So of course they're going to feel like they're missing out. Of course they're going to be thirsty. And of right. course women in their once they get into their 30s and they become financially successful, you know, the, the first woman with baby rabies that gives them a chance, mm -hmm. their life is over. So yes. I, I think that I think that that's kind of what's happening right now. And I don't like I, I was listening to a talk about this with one guy from the insult community. And he said that, you know, sex robots and dolls and all that kind of stuff will, will be enough to let the steam off, off mm. of their thirst so that, you know, society doesn't destroy itself. Right. And, and that kind of got me thinking, you know, these technologies are not there just so that men can have fun, but they're there so that, you know, society you doesn't it. destroy yeah. itself. Right. That, that, I mean, right. that's why we should be working on these technologies diligently. Mm. Anyway, go ahead. So do you think that, I mean... Uh, I think MGTOW and then, you know, if, if there's an incel community that, that follows them, it could be tied in. People typically will tie it in. They will say, well, you guys are just incels, right? Well, then if there's no sympathy, like we could understand it, you know, because we're saying just stay away from it. But there's a certain community that would be like, say, you're a PUA. You would rain down on MGTOW and, and, uh, and incels, and then women won't be as sympathetic as well. Well, so if you have the people. What's think, the what's the what's going to happen then? What's going to happen then if you have an unsympathetic group over here of men who believe that they're better than everybody? Then you have an unsympathetic group of women who are just getting used and abused on dating apps, and then you have in between MGTLW and incel. What happens then? Well, I, I think we have to kind of identify, you know, the PUA, the MRA, and the incel communities. They're all about female validation. The, the MGTOW community is is not about female validation. It, yeah. not so much about it. So, so you have to kind of look at these groups as gynocentric in, in, a, in a sense versus mm. not gynocentric. That's why, you know, you, the MRAs don't necessarily like men going their own way. That's why the incels don't necessarily like men going their own way. But incels, if they get action and then they, they, they go through and they, and they get enough, then they can kind of move on to the men going their own way movement. They would go and transition. Got you. Yeah. So I, I that's, that's kind of, um, I think that the idea is to use technology somehow to to make them feel satiated sexually so that they can go their own way. I think that that would be yeah. the best way to go because then they're not destructive, then they can self-actualize, then they can start working on their own lives, but they can also feel like they they're not missing out on anything. And yeah. I, I think that's that's the goal of of what I'm trying to accomplish anyway. So I, I think I think that's that would be good because a stable society, sexually right. satisfied men have a purpose, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a good life. And then if, you know, we want to use surrogates or artificial wombs at some point in the future, we can use those technologies to, to allow, you know, reproduction as well, because look, if 50% of guys are now in cells mm -hmm. and, and young guys between 18 to 25, and it gets worse and worse, there's right. the next generation is only going to be half the size. Right. Yep. And th not only that, but, something like for every hundred females that are born, 106 males are born. So right. you're already looking at a gender uh, discrepancy and balance, right? There. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So the balance is there. And because we don't go to war because we don't die in dangerous accidents as much as we used to, that imbalance is going to get worse and worse. And then, you know, get countries like India and China because of the, the you know, one child policy or because of, you know, right. uh, because of, you know, selective, you know, mothers would select, have selective abortions for females, you're mm -hmm. starting to see massive imbalances in population. And so you're, what are you going to do with all these surplus males, right? Mm -hmm. If they're not getting any sex, they're not getting any relationships. What are, what are you going to do with them? Yeah. So it's going to destabilize everything. Interesting, interesting stuff, man. We can probably go on, on, on that topic. I'm glad you brought that up because we did talk about it. Um, but uh, let me do some super chats real quick. Hang tight, get a water break. 
Uh, Camster email says, Coach of Sandman it is the holy duo saving men's lives. Shout out to you guys. I'm going to read through these fast. Inspire One says, much respect to Sandman. I honestly thought until now that it was a computer generated program. All right. <laughs> But you can see he has a real voice. All right. Shout out to uh, him. Eddie Sanchez says, what motives? Uh, he says, what motives you both or what motivates you both to get MGTOW uh, message out daily? I appreciate both of you for all that you have done. What motivates you every day to keep going, Sam? Man? Well, I'm trying to get to the point where I can get to the 10 year mark. I'm thinking that mm. would be either a good place to either stop or to slowly phase out or just kind of not do it daily. I just, yeah. I don't know anyone who's done daily content for 10 years. So I would like to do to 10 years, put out a video every day and that's motivating me. And I'm about three years and four months away from that. So I'm kind of looking at that. Another, another thing that motivates me is I'm trying to get to, if like, if everything goes according to plan as of right now, within two years, I will be completely, um, you know, I will have enough FU money to basically, <laughs> you know, not have to depend on oh, either of really on revenue from my photography video business or my revenue from this. And yeah. if I can do that, then I can start to take some of my surplus revenue that I would continue to make and put it into working on my lover bot virtual sex system that I'm working on. Yeah. And that, I would probably do that full time after the 10 year mark. So yeah. I would gather enough cash to it after, you know, two years and then another year and a half, two years, I would gather enough cash and capital to kind of get that business started. Got it. Whether I do a Kickstarter, I don't know. I still haven't figured that out yet. But I think that that's, like I said earlier, that's the that's the thing to keep society stable. Like we have to give the fifty percent of men who've been taken away from sex in because of dating apps, we have yep. to give them an outlet to keep things from getting really really bad out there. So that's well, what the thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you tack on the guys that have gone their own way in the generation before that. That's a whole another group of men. Uh, they have to find an outlet, right? But I'm not so much worried about, you know, the, the men going their own way generation or the PUA right. generation or the MRA generation. We, you know, we did get enough, you know, action in the bedroom to kind of mm -hmm. feel like we're not missing out. I'm right. more worried about these guys. They're 18 to 25 primarily right now. But yeah. within five to 10 years, they're going to be 35 and they're going to start to be moving up in the ranks and companies. They're going to start to figure out ways to, take their aggression out on society. So that's what really worries me. You know, they, you know, like I said, they, they might burn the village down. They might right. not care. Right. So that, that, you know, we're starting to see that, you know, like the, the rioting and the looting and all this stuff. It, I think that's just a symptom of it. Could be, could be behind the scenes for sure. For, for some of them, for sure. Uh, Jarrell Boston says CGA needs to get big John on next. Then time, Tom like us. I'm going to reach out to Big John. We'll see if he wants to do it. He's kind of uh, other, uh, doing some other stuff, but he might want to poke his head in here. Mega <laughs> Tau says... Uh, to go on the Dr. Phil show. He's already been on, tell Big John to go on the Dr. Phil show. He's already been on CNN. He might want to go there too. We're going to talk about that in a minute. <laughs> we're going to talk about that in a minute, all right? Um, what, where are we at here? I got a whole bunch of Super Chats that I need to catch up on and, and hang tight, brothers. It's uh, Marcus A says, remember, fellas, a red pill a day keeps the track cons who have more men run through them than the Holland Tunnel away. Shout out to CGA and Sandman. Falcon Black says, uh, is shadow banning really a thing? How do you combat it? Salutes to the legends. OK, so um, this is one of the things that I wanted to cop cover in a top earlier topic of being a content creator. You obviously either your view, they're messing with your channel. They, I, they certainly are messing with this channel. On, on my main channel here because I have another channel that has 16,000 subscribers and it gets more views a day than a channel that has 115 like make sense of that all right either at, I've got, I see coach Greg Adams 114,000 subscribers okay yep, yep. Uh, you're getting a, yeah about 2 million views so no you're doing okay that's that's pretty that should be normal like I like yeah. I saw you get a nice spike when you first kind of started I saw this big spike September right last year yep. and then it kind of dipped down um you know I, I i think it's just because the novelty of your content back then That's like right. you, you started to take off before joker came in and better batch right. yeah so i had a big spike i was like one of the guys that had the big spike and then he came like eight months probably later after i started yeah and so he had a rocket ship yeah well that's the thing like your drop coincides with his ascent so i think oh, a lot of it has to do with uh you know people people switch content 
um, providers, they go from one place to another. They hop around a lot. Yeah. And so I, I think that that's definitely part of it. Like I'm seeing you're starting to see a little bit of a pickup and I'm starting to see a tiny, tiny, tiny pickup. But uh, again, a lot of my drop happened in, let me see here. It happened in July of 2019. And the, the reason for that was because that's when I was completely demonetized. That's when they took the YouTube that's red right. revenue away. So it made yeah. no sense for them to promote my content anymore, you know, because they weren't making any money off of it. They were paying for, you know, to serve it. So like the, you know, June of 2019, I was getting about 2 million views. Now I'm up, uh, getting close to up, back up to close to 1 million. So okay. That it was been a steady decline since I was demonetized. So, so is, is it the shadow banning or is it just the fact that they don't monetize the videos? Well, I'm sure I've been put on a list and it's also the demonetization. So it's like, I think it's a combination of both. Okay. So, so they, they took away the monetization of my videos, uh, but that I could still super chat. Right. So, um, oh, so they, are you saying that all of your videos are demonetized right now? All of them. I went to, I, in October, uh, 2019, I was in, um, I was in Cabo San Lucas and when I was on my way to the airport back, all of my videos one by one was losing monetization. All right. And I'm looking at it, I'm refreshing the screen and every second they're just demonetized, demonetized. And I'm sitting there like, wow, what happened? Okay. So you said October, 2019, that coincided with your drop. So that's right. when they that's when they demonetized and that so the demonetization um once that happens like but you still get youtube red right is that something I that still get, yeah they still yeah. So give me the they probably card. changed their policy so that so they when they demonetized me the first time like i got what happened to you happened to me in november of 2018 okay. so they didn't knock down my views my views continued even though i had youtube red right. it wasn't until july where they they completely cut me down so, okay. but for you, they cut you down right when they completely demonetized you. Exactly, it was the same. No, no. When they when they just took your ads down, they put it in limited limited they ads. Put it in limited. So yeah. anything I upload automatically goes to limited, even if I get a review. And I can't get new. Like if I put a new video up, like I have on the Free Agent Lifestyle channel, I went back to the old format. I put new videos up on this channel, and they don't get. There's no chance of me even getting a confirmation or review. You're saying on the Ask Coach Craig Adams, that one as well has been demonetized? No, that one's fine. The okay. other ones are fine. It's so just yeah, they're, so you're you're basically playing whack-a-mole and it, they're gonna they're gonna take, you know, they haven't found that channel yet, right? So right. so th my suggestion is this is what uh think before you you sleep suggests. He's like, look, don't monetize your channel. If you're a mm -hmm. new content creator, don't monetize your channel because mm -hmm. when they demonetize you, then they're gonna take all your views. So what you want to do is you want to build up your channel, avoid monetization, and then once once you build it up, you'll get Patreon, you'll get other things, you'll get other sources of income, yeah. and but you'll get like four times the views, five times the views somebody who's been demonetized has gotten. So right. that will make up for that loss of, uh, of views. Right. So and typically what I have to do is I actually have to do triple the work, right? You know, if I have wanted uh, any revenue, I basically have to have the other channels do content on that channel and then maintain this channel as a means of, hey, it's the biggest channel, right? It's the flagship um, because it does still get subscribers. But I've noticed that the subscriber, either, you know, like you said, people do move on to other content creators. They're like, all right, we already know what you're going to say. Monkey double backflips, right? So, so yeah, I mean, but you're, you're telling me that it doesn't matter if people use the MGTO, uh, the W acronym or not they're still going to get demonetized. Like, I mean, yeah. I didn't know that you were in the same situation I was. So the next step they'll probably take is take your YouTube red at some point. Right. Exactly. And then they, that means no more super chats. So right. that means they'll, they'll completely demonetize you at some point. Right. So exactly. that might mean you have to get um, D live or you have to try something different to, to keep your super chats going. Well, yeah, I think uh, other people say uh, donate direct to a PayPal app or a um, cash app while they're doing the live stream. So that's a, a yeah, so I, I would I would already be looking at figuring out ways to do that, or I'd be looking at getting sponsors. Because what happened to me was once they took my uh, like I took all my ads away, I was like, okay, well, I can do sponsorships, you know. And so I've been right. I pretty much have a sponsor for every video that I do, you know. And then I, you know, and then on top of that, I promote other products and services on other channels, right? So you you kind of have to branch out and yeah. and try new things that other people haven't really done, or you know, like Ter Terrence Pop has sponsorships every video i i you know i throw him money for that 
Yeah. Uh, but you know, there's, you know, TFM had sponsors for a long time. You know, I've been running spots. So you're going to have to figure out ways, like just imagine YouTube red and imagine all of your ad revenue disappearing tomorrow. Yeah. What other well, ways are you you're going to find to, to make, generate revenue? And I, I think this is good though, because it's forcing us to innovate and it's forcing us to get away from, you know, it's depending it, on them. Yeah. But we're still dependent on them in terms of the YouTube platform. So as long as we can stay away from getting completely struck out and thrown off the platform, we should yeah. be okay. Yeah. And I think the other thing that helped uh, content creators all across was the mainstream media, which that was getting pumped in the last five months on here, on this platform, it went away. Right. Uh, you know, at, at some point we were seeing the late night shows getting prime spots in the suggestion box, all of the CBS news and all of those organizations were getting prime spots and they were like, at some point YouTube was like, Hey, we don't need these other guys. And they were going to transition into a mainstream platform. But then what happened? Since well, the lockdown happened, there's less of this mainstream well, uh, information and you, all of us are now kind of getting the seat back at the table. Well, okay. They, they pumped all of this mainstream stuff for five, six months. And what ended up happening is their views and their subscribers went up, but then people got sick and tired of the you know, being constantly spammed by this stuff and they yeah. stopped watching it. So I'm looking at like CNN right now, yeah. you know, when they started promoting this stuff in like say April, 2020, they had 270 million views. Now they've dropped to around 200 million views. So they're already starting to, to decline. You know, they, they got 450,000 subscribers in March of 2020. Now they're back down to two to 300,000 subscribers. So they're, it doesn't matter how much you promote the mainstream. People will eventually get sick and tired of it. Yep. And and people will go to other platforms. Like BitChute, it, it had 30 million uh, visitors last month. And this month, it's probably going to be uh, 35, 32, 34, 35 million. So they're starting to ramp up. They're starting to – the more people they kick off, the more they're feeding their competition. And the people right. that – and I think that's another thing that helped uh, or made them change their ways because they were like, OK, these guys are leaving. Right. Well, maybe that's why all of a sudden I'm starting to see my subscriber counts go back up. Right. You know, it's really. I, weird. I, yeah. Same thing with me. Uh, OK. I'm looking at. Let me see. Uh, my like I was, at, I was lingering between 90 and and that 100 mark for months. I mean, six or seven months that I was lingering. Now, all of a sudden it bumped up and I've seen other content creators that I passed, they weren't doing any well. And then all of a sudden they zip past me in three months. So I think a lot of people are um, either finding this message because they're sitting at home or uh, I think the restraints have been let off just for a little bit. Well, I'm looking at, okay, so this in August, I had 2,300 subscribers. Doesn't sound like a lot, but the month before I only had 860, the month before I had 400, the month yeah. before I had 200, right? So I don't know what happened in August, but they've now bumped up my views and they've bumped up my subscriber counts. Right. And and I don't know why they're doing this. Like all of a sudden they've they've changed their their tune. Maybe they're maybe they're starting to see that, hey, if we start chasing our audience away, we're gonna yeah. build up our comp. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Maybe it's, it's interesting because I see even political, you know, people who live uh lean toward conservative views, they they skyrocket. They went nuts. Like I've seen people get 500,000 uh subs when they were sitting at 200. Now all of a sudden they're trying to hit on a million, right? Because of their uh content is relevant. Well so Trump did say, happen. Trump did say that he was going to start punishing social oh, media companies. That's what it was. And and that was about I think it was a month or a month and a half ago he said yeah. that. And yep. if they didn't change their tune in a month, then he would start punishing them. That's exactly that's that's exactly thing. when we, we see that. I don't know if that if correlation equals causa causation, yep. Yep. Or causation equals correlation. Yep. I don't get those confused. Uh, yep. But uh, like it's definitely definitely something different. Like it's yep. I'm looking at it yep. like what the hell are you doing? Like why am I getting an audience again? Like where is yep. the suppression? What's yep. what's happening here? Yep. I agree. Let me do a couple more super chats. John Ellison says, I'm a black man from Detroit and Sandman. You led me on my journey and now I'm a regular guy with CGA. Thanks to you both. Nor Goldfinger, thanks for you. Red Sings the Blue says, um, he says, I'm almost three months um, and almost to 300 subs. He says, it's almost there and a lot of guys, big guys like Coach have shouted out and recommended my channel. Uh, tip to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. David Hunter says, did the Japanese herbivore men have influence in the development of injury TOW. What do you think? Well, I, I think there, you know, there's different 
okay, you've got the herbivore men, but you've also got the hikikomori. So a lot of people kind of get those two groups uh, kind of mixed up. Uh, the herbivore men, well, let, let me answer the first question before I go yeah, into it. I, I think it's, it's, it's not so much influence. I think, you know, I think we saw what was going on. Like I remember making videos about the herbivore men back in 2013, yeah. 2014. And I was like, wait a minute, Japan is already ahead of the time ahead in this game. So maybe these guys figured something out before we did. And, you know, maybe we have something to learn from them. So we looked at, you know, them and there's the herbivore men, but there's also the dry fish lady. So they had women over there that started kind of going their own way, you know, the women going their own way kind of thing as, as well at the same time. And I think that was kind of a response to, to the, to the herbivore men kind of thing going over there. But just to make that distinction between herbivore men and hikikomori. Now the hikikomori, the, the shut-ins, the people, you know, they always sensationalize them. Like they don't leave their bedroom for like seven years or something like that. But that's not actually true. What he, like the, there's um, social scientists that have been studying this, and they say the, the average hikikomori, the average shut-in, leaves their house maybe three times, four times a week. And then I thought about it. I'm like, well, that totally describes me. You know, I'll go shopping and I'll, yep. and I'll go hang out with somebody or friends or whatever, like you know, three, four times a week. So I'm technically in the hikikomori shut-in camp. I mean, I didn't know this, but. It's it's a social phenomenon that that has to do with um, uh, like if you, the, depending on how you were raised, depending on if you went through hardships, if you weren't accepted socially by other people, um, that makes you hikiko more. That's more likely to make you kind of go in that direction. As for herbivore men, a lot of it has to do with the fact that you know in Japan the the salary men, the fathers of the, you know the mothers of these these boys, these guys who've now become men they would work themselves to death. So mm -hmm. the, the theory is that, you know, they saw this and they don't want to work themselves to death. They'd rather go eat pudding and play video games than mm -hmm. they get than married. But yeah, right. I, I think it's more complicated than that. I think that the herbivore men, I don't think a lot of them are doing it by choice. I think that there's also some of that insult phenomenon going on in Japan as well. Okay. Is the Japanese women have higher standards. They yeah. go to the host bars where they get like, you know, four or five women get entertained by one man who, you know, in the, in the host bar. So I think there's, there's more to it. I don't think we're digging deeply into it. That insult documentary I was talking to you about, um, they interviewed one woman who's a social scientist. I think she was actually the one who coined the term herbivore men. I, I don't correct me if I'm wrong on that. And she said, the answer, it seems to all of these problems is going to be polygyny. You know, we're going to have to have talking about women to one man because yeah. Women are not going to change their standards. Their standards are only going to get worse. So right. if we want a society to, you know, replicate and and reproduce, we're going to have to allow. Um, we're going to have to allow for that. Right. I don't know if that's that's going to happen. I, like I don't know if the governments are just going to start. You know, they're going to be like Utah, you know, Utah and like the Mormons, and all of a sudden, you know, we're all going to become Mormons. I don't know. I doubt it. But something's got to happen because remember, it's not just okay. If the next generation is only half the size of this one. It, you know, if older guys, let's say they're in their 30s and 40s, are looking for a wife, and they're looking for you know women in their early to mid 20s. Well, there's only half as many of those women because the next generation below is half the size. Right. So that means you're not only you know you're not only reducing uh, the available women to the guys in the lower brackets, but you're also reducing the available women to the guys in the higher brackets. Right. So you know, a guy would have to have five or you know six, seven, eight million dollars to attract an average yeah. mid 20 to put in her mid 20. Like it, it's going to get ridiculous. Like, no, the, yeah, yeah. It, it can't keep up with itself, but I think we're seeing a lot of polyamory being more acceptable, but I think instead of it being, instead of it being uh one man, five women, women are saying, yeah, let's do this polyamory uh, polygyny thing, but I'm going to have five men. Right. Well, I, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, you know, like having, having throwing like a fisherman, you know, you cast out four or five rods and then you hope for one of those men to pay off. So, you know, you, and then you reel that guy in at the right. end. Right? So you're, okay. you're trying to hook as many guys as possible. Yeah. And then if every woman is doing that, like, so, you know, if that woman is sharing five guys, you know, what if, what if one of those other guys, the good guys connected to another woman, you know? So all of a sudden he's going around and having five different women and they don't all know about each other because, <laughs> and this woman thinks that she has five guys that are exclusive Meanwhile, right. some of those guys are playing her, even though she thinks she's playing that. And then all of a sudden, that one of that guy becomes successful, and then he, you know, he's got five women that are all after him, and he gets to pick the best one. 
So well, see, this is why the MGTOW philosophy makes the most sense because it's getting to the point where even even if you were a PUA and you said this is how you approach and get a woman, well, that's not working either. Okay, even that doesn't, uh, you know, it's, it, it leaves you exposed to a lot of the situations that we say, yeah, but long term, and then now you have polyandry, you have polygyny, you have polygamy uh, as an option people are seeking out. And then you have us going, look, man, just focus on yourself, right? I mean, just eliminate all of this uh, attempts to try to try to correct the issue that is incorrectable. Well, there's a, in that incel documentary I was telling you about, there's a, it, there's an interview segment with Roosh V and Roosh says, you know, he feels sorry for the younger PUAs that are, you know, 10 years younger than he is because he says now they have to work twice as hard at their job and they have to work twice as hard with women to get their game on with them. So he's like, and this is all in the last 10 years. And he believes that, that it's also connected to the dating app situation. Right. And again, this all started in the, you know, Tinder was 2012. I, I got out of my last ma massive long-term relationship 2013. So, mm -hmm. you know, I dated around a little bit, but I, I found that women in 2015, 16, they became really mean. Like I'm talking about like the, 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 the spitefulness that was coming out. I was like, what is going on? Like what happened to, you know, to women, like being able to control their emotions to the point where, you know, they get into a relationship and then they would start to nag you. And then they would start to like complain about things. No, they would do start doing it right off the bat, right off the bat. Yeah. I think the entitlement, whatever it was, and that was at the peak of our content and peak peak of uh i think a lot of that changed there was a big change i thought 2014 2015 where that was when the, that was my last attempt to try to be like all right i'm gonna make a situation work well it was unworkable yeah exactly it people were, it was like no this is not possible so only a guy from a previous generation could see that though right yeah, exactly exactly gen z i mean gen x guys are looking like what happened so well, if you're a millennial you wouldn't you're notice. 24 years old right now and yeah. you're imagine it's been five years since 2015, 2016. Just yeah. imagine how bad it's gotten since then. Right. Like, I can't even imagine. Like, I don't even want to imagine. But like these guys are just they're like, it's not even if they wanted to go out, like even if they could get a couple dates, they would they would be they would be shit on so badly. It's, that's just step one. And and that's what the PUA game is. They're like, well, why are you guys quitting? Because step one, we're like, we don't care about step one. Step one is easy. OK, to get dates and girls, that's to me, for a person like me, I have no problem there. It is step three, four, five, year five, year six that are going to be complicated for men. And that's where our subject matter is. It's not getting women. Uh, you know, there's a 50 percent of men that aren't getting women, but there's 50 percent of men that are at least getting one, two with not a, with not a problem. Well, so the problem isn't the ability to get a woman. The problem is then the the, the marital laws, you know, domestic violation claims. The Me Too movement, there's a whole bunch of other issues that a lot of guys aren't addressing, but yet they're still coming here to say, it, and, and that's a perfect time. Your general state of the manosphere, uh, there's some infighting between groups, factions, content creator. I think you had a little bit of a tiff at one point. I have every now a little bit something that sparks up where either I initiated one, admittedly, and then the other ones, simply when you start to gain an audience, then they try to initiate with you, right? Um, my whole goal and focus is not to necessarily uh, complicate things by creating division. This is why I bring in multiple people from different uh, things here. But where are we at now in terms of content creators in a manosphere? Is this going to go mainstream with your situation right now? I don't think it's going to go mainstream anytime soon in, in, in the traditional sense. I don't think we're going to be on television. Like, again, we're, we don't own the platforms, the television platforms. So like we are like YouTube is becoming the mainstream. So that's true. think about, Oh, are, are we going to go mainstream? Are we going to go in, you know, the, the popular consciousness? I think we will. It just won't be obvious. You know, there won't be anyone out there promoting it on the newspapers, promoting it on television, talking about it in those places. So I, I, I think it's already mainstream in a lot of ways. A lot of guys are already talking about these ideas in their own, lives and it's just yeah. they don't even know where they're coming from you know we, we hear the term simps and cucks and yes you know, but where did it all come from we we created those terms we put those right. terms out there we elevated them that's for sure we elevated and, them 
and and yeah, and and then what happened was they were picked up by other groups, and nobody really knows the the origin of those things. Yep, yep. You know? But we're so, seeing we're seeing even celebrities and professional athletes starting to um, even in their simpness. All right, they're starting. We know they listen to us. All right, for us to be have the audience that we have, we got we have to understand that there are some celebrity elements that do listen to us. They're not going to admit it. All right, um, or they may you know so. We're seeing them talk red pill talking points, but they can only go so far, right? They can only go so far with it. They just can't come out here and say, I'm going my own way, but they'll talk about prenups. They'll talk about, you know, the state of women and they're not builders. We've heard a lot of celebrities talk about this stuff. Well, okay. Look at it this way. So if I put out a video about, let me see, how many views did it get? So I'm going to do Leonardo DiCaprio. Mm -hmm. Like, we know that guy is playing the field, right? Like he's 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 not he's making sure they're not older than twenty five, and then he dumps them. Uh, let me see yeah. how many how many views. So if I put out a video about Leonardo DiCaprio shaming MGTOW celebrities, top ten MGTOW celebrities. So here's one: Leonardo DiCaprio thumbnail, one hundred and fifty seven thousand views. Yeah. You're telling me that celebrities aren't looking themselves up and seeing what exactly. people are talking about. That's exactly so that's my point. So, you know, I talk about Elon Musk, you know, being, you know, uh, totally red pilled and, you know, totally like he's not letting, allowing women to play him. Like he he told he got his wife to sign a post nup. Right? Like, how, right. Who does that? like who convinced his wife to sign a post nup and then she didn't get all the billions of dollars. Right. Yeah. Like, right. So, you know, so he's he's he, you know, and his, and his current uh, girlfriend, I don't know if they're engaged or married. He sold all his properties, and then he and then in, on Twitter he posts, "Ha ha, she she doesn't like that I sold all my houses, right?" Like, <laughs> so he knows, like he, he knows. knows. He, tried, he knows the gold diggers are, and, and meanwhile he got what he wanted, which is another kid. I don't yeah. know, what, you know, he, he wanted another child. Okay, fine, but you know he's he understands female nature, and it, just his behavior is is proving that to me. So. Yeah. You know, and people are looking up to him and they're saying, wow, if, you know, he's doing this and he's doing that. And he's selling his houses and he's, you know, a, a, not letting his wife or his yep. girlfriend get access to that. Yep. He's a smart guy, right? He's a smart guy. And then eventually that'll influence other people, but they may not know it directly came from us day to day posting this content, right? For a person like that to pick it up and then spread it to uh, other men. And, and in that sense, let's talk about your situation then about you being invited to go on Dr. Phil. All right. <laughs> so I didn't get an invitation by the way, but you know, I'm not, I don't expect the invitation in this situation, but you've been around long enough. People know um, that, that this message is here. So they're trying to invite some people to come in. Do you think this is an opportunity to expose, you know, they're not trying to help us in our situation. <laughs> they ain't trying to hear our issues out. Uh, Big John did this and he went on CNN. They they didn't butcher him for the most part, but the after effect of his appearance on CNN literally demonetized and deplatformed a lot of guys like the next day. Yeah, though, no, that was about a week later. Every single channel was demonetized. Every, well, the, but you know what's funny? I'm sorry to cut you off. You know what's funny? When that happened, that was when I started making content, right? <laughs> I didn't even have monetization. So by virtue of everybody else getting demonetized, I, I didn't because I didn't even have monetization. So that's when I took off. That but that bought you a year. That bought you a year, right? So and that got me a year. <laughs> so I was like, that actually helped me when everybody else. I mean, I can I, I can think of a whole bunch of guys that got the platform as a result of Big John. So now let's say you're in a situation. Do you think this is an opportunity to take it mi mainstream where people understand us or is it an expose? Well, let me read. Let me read the, uh, the the exact message that I got from Patrick Farrelly, who is okay. one of the Doctor Phil producers. He says, "Hello, I'm a producer on the Doctor Phil Talk Show. I'm putting a show together about the role of men in 2020, and I'm looking for people who feel strongly about this issue to take part in a lively debate on our show. Mm -hmm. Which technically means we're going to attack you, and you know we're going to throw everything at you, right? Like, oh, and then and then he continues by saying." If this is something you're open to, please let me know and we can schedule a phone call. Thank you, Patrick Farley. So mm -hmm. my thinking is, yeah, maybe schedule a phone call, record right. the phone call. Yes. Get permission that I can use. Can I, can I, am I, do I have permission to record this phone call? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. 
do I have, you know, do I permit, you know, just see if I can get that permission in the beginning and then I can just share it online with everybody. And then everyone can pretty much tear into this guy and tear into the Dr. Phil show and know the workings behind. Yeah. That, it, I think that's, it's one of the mistakes that I think big John did it uh, or he didn't make, or he didn't do was that he didn't have his own crew behind the scene. No. Right. Like I would have had a big, I would have had my videographer apart. So that when they diced up and chopped up the interview, I can say, well, this is what I actually said. Well, you know, I, I did a, I did an interview, a phone over the phone interview with a guy from, from Europe. And he wanted to, he wanted to fly a crew out to Canada mm -hmm. and into a hotel room and bring me in and interview me. So I'm like, so it wasn't just like, we're going to fly you into the Dr. Phil show, which we've already set up. No, they were, they wanted to bring in like their own people to kind of follow me wherever I was. They were going to come to me and film me. And I was like, okay. This is odd, oddly suspicious. Like, what right. is going on? And you know, and I looked up the the backers of um of that TV station, and they were people like the the crown prince of Monaco. You know, they, it was the majority. Mm -hmm. Like, what the hell is going? You know, a couple friends, a couple friends are like, you know, they could be the Illuminati after. <laughs> like, okay, yeah. like like well, you know, they're trying to knock you down. It's like, be careful. I'm like, yeah, yeah. but I, I and I said I dug a little bit deeper, and I realized well, in Canada we have a different freedom of speech laws. So in Canada, if you go on to radio, if you go on to television, they can get you for hate speech if you say something that's inappropriate and you can go to jail. Oh, got so, it. Got so it. again, it's not, it doesn't just come down to um, just, oh, you were just going to have a nice conversation and discredit you on national television. It has right. to do with we're going to literally throw you in jail. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. So that, that's kind of what worried me about this. And they were pushing so hard to get this interview with me. And mm. in the end, what they, what they did was they interviewed Jordan Peterson, the same guy who I talked to over the phone, who I stood my ground with, you know, he said, what did he say? Um, he said, you know, uh, you know, you know, like simps are basically pussies. And I said, well, you're the one that's putting pussy in my mouth, right? So it was like, <laughs> you know, like, and, and I just started laughing. And it, it's just like he said himself. Anyway, if you, you have to, you have to understand the context, right? That right, because you know he he insulted me first by saying I don't want relationships, and then I, you know, I said I I made that comment. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. yeah. But well, he he well, went on with the Jordan Peterson, and Jordan Jordan Peterson was agitated, like he got angry, and he he literally almost lost it in front of this okay. like. 30 year old punk kid, but this isn't just some 30 year old punk kid. His father was a main, one of the major politicians in uh, the socialist party in France. Okay. So you're digging behind the scenes. You start to see, you know, yep. Monaco crown prince, you know, yep. socialist son of the socialist. Uh, I, I think he was finance minister or something in France. Like, so the, there's, there's a lot more to it than just, we want to interview Sandman for our TV show. You know, you can read into so many other things. Yeah. Find that. And one one of the things I think when I was around 50,000 subs, I think I had a um, casting agent from New York and uh, call me about TV shows. And they put out shows like either like what is the one fiance like they put out legit shows. All right. And I looked her up. She was legit. She contacted me several times. Uh, anybody that's been following me probably remember me doing a video about this. And she was like, look, I, I found your content. They watched a certain video that was that had a lot of views. And she said, look, I want to get you on here. Maybe you can be one of the one of the talking heads that deciphers what's going on in people's relationships. Right. So at the time, I'm like, this is out of nowhere. Right. I'm like, what is this about? So I brought it to the audience and most of the audience said, don't do it. All right. Because it's going to uh, they're not they're not there to help you or promote you essentially. Uh, they could they could make you look bad. All right. And at that time, I was just experiencing a rise. I, I wasn't in the position to take that. Um, you know, I was I was not protectful of my brand, let's just say. All right. I really didn't know that there was a brand. But now there's more subs, there's more of an audience, and I'm understanding how media works, where I would look at that situation and go, I don't know if that was the right situation to put myself into. I probably would have crashed and burned pretty fast. And there could have been a um you know, an ulterior motive that I wouldn't have been able to investigate at that time of the offer. Yeah. I just, I put, I put up uh, a post about the uh, Dr. Phil thing and people are saying, don't do it. You will regret it. And your credibility yeah. will be ruined. 
Right. Uh, people say, you know, wear a full face mask. Other people say, Dr. Phil is a female audience. Don't, you, you don't want to upset right. shows feminist narrative. <laughs> so, you know, I, it, we know what's going to happen. Like, uh, we know. You know, Roosh V went on uh, uh, Dr. Oz, was it Oz or Dr. Oz? I can't remember. And uh, Dick Masterson also went on to, what, what is it called? Uh, Dr. Phil. And, you know, they were totally attacked constantly. So, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I know full well that I could probably hold my own, but right. I just know that when I had that call with that guy from Europe, it was probably the most stressful hour and a half that I've had in probably the last five years. Mm -hmm. I had to, I had to, I had to like up my game to the point where like, no matter what he threw at me, I had to be ready. And, and, and then when I saw that Jordan Peterson interview, I was like, Oh man, like no, that Jordan Peterson, like literally near, he almost lost his cool and he yeah. never loses his cool. So I realized I could do this. I could go on those shows and I could, I could totally, you know, do, you know, Dr. Phil could say, you know, you know, why did you go your own way? And I go, well, it started back when I watched the Oprah Winfrey show back in the nineties. You know? <laughs> she said that women like nice guys. So I start, I took her belief to heart and I, I was the nice guy and it didn't work for me. It, I, I, you know, mm -hmm. women didn't, you know, didn't like me. So what do you make of that? Dr. Phil. Yeah. <laughs> oh, or like he can't, yeah. you know, I've, I've put his boss on the spot. Yeah. He's going to talk yeah. about his own boss yeah. on television, right? Like, uh Oh, like don't go there. Don't go yeah. there. You know, don't like, go there. Yeah. Then you're going to oh. get roasted from that, from that point on. Well, no, I'm not going to get roasted. I've put him in a, in a hard spot. So like, but that won't be even make it to the show. That's the they thing. Won't even make it on. They're going to cut that out. They're going to cut like 90% of the show out. And exactly. all the only, only things you're going to see is like an audience of angry women booing at me. Yep. And you're going to see Dr. Phil like laughing at, like, that's all you're going to see. Like, yeah. why would I do that? Like, yeah, even yeah. if I recorded and put it out there, you know, and, and it just, it doesn't get me anywhere. Yeah. Know? What the public's going to see is not what was reflected. And that's, that's what guys got to know. I mean, if, if it goes any mainstream, whatever that our message is, it's not going to be, it's not going to be treated with kid gloves, right? I mean, I'd have to, I'd have to like, you know, to, to really make a difference, I'd have to, I'd have to show up like the Joker on, uh, in that film, right? Like it just be like, Hey there, Philly. You know? Right. Yeah, that exactly. Good, yeah. Right? <laughs> you have to make it uh, completely outlandish. Cause if you take it, you try to speak seriously on these topics, they're just going to be like, I mean, we see it. I mean, I post on social media and every now and then a woman will come in here, act like the divorce rate is not 65%, act like women don't file 80% of the divorce. They act like they're just like, that is not a truth to them. So if we're speaking serious and say, well, 80% of divorces are filed by women, they would be like, what? Or what does that mean? That means 80% of the marriages that failed were, were men's fault, right? Okay. So I, I think that's a good segue into this segment. I now, yeah. now, I haven't done any research in terms of uh, why the divorce rates are spiking during the coup. Why? I have an article to read about that. So, so what is, like, have you read the article or are you just – I have. I have oh. read the article. So they you, they, give, a certain, they give some points. They make some points, and we're going to talk about that. H hold your thought because I got to catch up on a lot of Super Chat. Okay. All right. Uh, take a drink. My man Don Papel says CGA and Sandman has saved men's lives for more than half a death cage. Uh, hashtag Sandman saves lives. McKee says, this is a fantastic stream. I've been watching both of your channels for over a year, and it's uh, been a ton helpful. Thanks. I have a Jayco with the co-sponsorship, says Sandman and Coach, two living legends. Appreciate you, man. KZ1000 Guy 1 says, thank you both for being great content uh, creators since I discovered you both a year and a half ago, saving my sanity some days. All right. Hope to see you continue to make great content. I appreciate you. Fuzzy Electronics says, the, peak, the price of peace leave is $60 for a half an hour in the U.K., for an eight or a nine, but women's price themselves out of the market and then wonder where all the good men have gone. Shout out to you. Jarrell boss says, remember Holly Berry got paid 1 million to show skin and get banged out on the TV screen. Shout out to you. Mega MGTOW or Mega Tao says, uh, thank you, Sam man for freeing me for my traditional ways of thinking in the era of no female accountability. One of the family, but realized it was selfish not to consider the inevitable impact of divorce for children. Any ideas on how there's a, uh, uh, the prince. I'm not dispense. I'm not sure what that meant, but give me a second. We're going to get back to that. Arise says, what's up, Sandman? I like your videos. AL says, legalized prostitution, her body, her choice. Adrian Paul says, thanks, Sandman and coach. This is my first super chat to your channel. Greetings from the MW. Shout out to you. I don't know where the MW is. Is that Minotaur? Is that in Canada? And then 
LVZ Cypher says, uh, started my MGTOW journey with Sandman in 2015, then backtracked to Tom Likas. Now I'm here with the likes of CGA and Joker, and that's where I started with Tom Likas and then eventually in the Sandman. Let me do a couple more. All right, Sandman says, Sandman, I love you, and I'm not G-A-Y. Scott Graff says, your opinion is uh, MGTOW red pill affecting court funds on a larger scale. We're going to talk about that with the family court issue. William C says, Sandman, thoughts on Roll Tomasi and Richard? Who? Who? No, I'm just saying uh, the consistently uh, put MGTOW black pill and incels under the same umbrella. Thanks for all the work. We kind of covered that. So we're not going to go into that too much. We don't want to give people shine that don't need to give me shine. All right. Rob Sawyer says incels are made because they get the women. They can't get the women they want. Too much peace leave out there. It's an internal issue if they can't get it. All right. Um. Man, I need to catch up, but let me uh, acknowledge some guys in here. Steph is cold with the sponsorship. Salute to two goats. The mainstream hates masculinity, and that is the huge, huge issue there. The mainstream does hate masculinity, and they want us to take all the blame for um, what's going on here. And I think they said Better Bachelor was in the building as well. We're going to catch up to the Super Chats brothers, but we got to get Sandman on board right here in the rise of divorce rates in 2020. Now, I'm going to read a little bit of the article so we can see, and I'm going to have Sandman do his best to break this down. New York Post, uh, posting this September 1st, U.S. divorce rates skyrocket amid, amid, you know, the virus pandemic. And it says divorce rates have spiked in the U.S. during the pandemic as couples have been struck stuck at home for months. The number of people looking for divorces were 34% higher from March till June compared to 2019, the previous year. And then they uh, list the source. The combination of stress, unemployment, financial strain, death of loved ones, illnesses, homeschooling children, mental illnesses, and more have put significant strain on relationships. The data shows that 31% of the couples admitted that the lockdown has caused irreparable damage to their relationship. Interest in separation during the quarantine peak April 13th, just 15 to 20 days until the vast majority of states began their lockdowns. Quote, the uptick can, uh, could coincide with health and human service professionals referred to as delusionment phase of the phase of disaster. The time where optimistic optimism turned to discouragement, stress heightened and negative re uh, reactions often occurred, the group wrote. And here's one more thing. They said they also found that newlyweds took the hardest hit. In fact, 20% of couples who sought divorces who were married within the first five months or less, <laughs> the first five months or less, 20% of them sought divorces compared to the previous year where 11% sought divorces okay so they didn't say anything about female nature they didn't say anything about that now what do you hear from this breakdown here there's a little more of the article i posted a link in the description box if you want to read it what do you think man i think there's a lot of reasons i think you know the fact that guys are losing their jobs or their income <laughs> dropping so women are kind of like well let's see what's somebody's making more money over there let's see if i could get get somebody better over there they, they don't want to wait for, you know, for things to pick back up. They're gonna just try to monkey branch to somebody else. Now, the first time I heard about this economic divorce thing was from a woman. She used to live in a, in a Canadian city called Sudbury. It used to be like a, like a steel town back in the day. And she said that once all the steel jobs disappeared, all of a sudden the divorce rate just shot up through the roof, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, she said, you know, like all of a sudden guys who lost their jobs would get together with women who were like lower sexual marketplace value because they divorced their, their husbands and the, their husbands went with women that were right. So all of a sudden, it, it, like d the sexual marketplace was dictating coupling and the sexual marketplace, there's a lot of different varying factors. So we, we understand like certain cities, like I, I would, what I'd like to know is what cities are being hit the hardest? Is it the blue states, the red states? Is it the cities? Is it the rural areas? Is it the suburbs? Like okay. I, here's here's a here's a here's a from the article right here. States along the Bible Belt recorded the highest number of divorce rates during the pandemic, including Arkansas and Alabama. Wow, wow! Right. So I, I, I did not see that coming. I thought it would be the blue states. The, right. So, but, but this is for people who lived through the 
last recession, recession, uh, the 2009 era. Great recession, yep. Right. I remember there were guys doing mortgage loans, making, you know, $300,000 a year easily doing refinances. When that hit in, in a place like Southern California, well, the divorce rate went through the roof. All right. Because why? These men had money and then now they don't got money. And then the divorce rate uh, soon uh, follows. So your point is men got displaced because of this. Maybe women got displaced. The finances took a hit and now it was time to monkey branch. Yeah, but but Arkansas and Alabama, like what options do these women have in Arkansas and Alabama? <laughs> Where are they gonna go? Like, what are they gonna do? Like right. they're already down on the the bottom end of the the financial socioeconomic scale. So where, where are they gonna go? They're gonna right. go across the border into Mexico to look for a man? I, I don't know. And the idea that they could support themselves at the divorce, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not we're just making prejudgments about Arkansas, but they do have a 60% obesity rate of women in Arkansas. So like you're saying, what, well, how much better are you going to do? Um, and the fact that Arkansas is another welfare state, how much more can you support yourself? I mean, is well, this going to be economically a better decision for you? Well, maybe, maybe, maybe it has to do with the fact that now these overweight women are starting to see themselves as like hot and empowered because, you know, the culture is yeah. affected in the last five to 10 years. You know, the BBW yeah. women are like, their expectations are way, way higher. Right. So now all of a sudden, you know, they, they, they think they're all that in a bag of chips, right? Like, I don't right. know what's going so, on. Well, they can go online. They can go online and definitely pick up the idea that they have value. I mean, this is the scent marketplace uh, that we've, we're have we trying to at least get men to understand what you're doing. So I did a great live stream about this, breaking down, saying, listen, we understand you like the peace lead. We understand. However, when you go above and beyond for any Peacefully, well, then now you've just inflated the marketplace value of somebody that have no business, all right, thinking this way about themselves. Now, everybody has their uh, preferences, but then when you inflate a four to a nine, now what have you done to the marketplace? Well, the marketplace is even more skewed. Like, I, I like the last, I don't know, bunch of weddings that I've done, it's all been older women and younger guys. Mm. Like, you know, even wow. mothers marrying young, successful guys. So younger, successful guys are basically tall, successful, muscular, marrying right. single mothers. Like, I'm like, what is going on? And, and the insult community, the, the sexual marketplace dynamics have changed to the point where men with higher sexual marketplace value, all of our points have dropped a couple points. And women right. with lower sexual marketplace, they've all elevated themselves. So- Dang. And the women at the top end, they're starting to completely outprice themselves out of the market entirely. Yeah, they can't even compete. I mean, there's nobody there for them. There's very few men there for them. I mean, if you're eight, nine or 10, this is the Tommy Lauren effect, right? Who, you know, everybody has an opinion on where she looks, but she, by American standards, would be like eight. OK, so with makeup and hair extensions and such. So now if she goes in and says, hey, my marketplace value is so high, I can't find anybody. Well, now what does that say? You, she only has 10 options. She only has 10 good men to pick from if men have went down two ticks. Well, uh, Karen Strawn in that in that insult documentary I was telling you about, she said, you know, uh, in the past, you know, one of these guys would have had the ability to date like a homely looking or, or chubby woman mm -hmm. and get married and have a family with her. But now that option's being taken off the table. Right. And for, you know, the more attractive guys are now taking up all the fatties. So like the guys at the bottom are like, well, what are we going to do? We got, we don't have wow. any, all the homely women are gone. What are we going to do? Dang. And, you know, so we're going to get a waifu pillow. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> that is, man, I never thought of it that way, but that, that's right. That's right. I mean, the homelier women are, are, are game now, or they're overweight, they're game for a very high status male. And we're seeing that being exposed. A lot of women are coming here and saying, you know, uh, I have nothing. I live in a Cracker Jack box. Uh, I'm a four on the scale, but I want the top guy. Well, everybody, I mean, everybody wants the top guy and there's not enough top guys, but there's certainly a lot more very uh, average looking women. But those average looking women want the top guy, man. Yeah, I mean, TFM and I kind of had the same strategy when we were younger. We would we would date women that were, let's say, a, more than a few notch points below us, so right. that we could, we could we would be like, sure, this woman's not going anywhere. Like right. she's not going to leave us because we know her options are not any better. Yeah. We're, 
And, you know, in the end, what ends up happening is she still ends up presenting us. She still ends up treating us the way she would have treated a guy on, on, on her own level. Yep. So the treatment is exactly the same. So you might as well go for the more attractive woman and get treated the same way down the road. That's true. <laughs> uh, yeah, man. You know, for some, sometimes a PUA might make a little sense. I get it. I mean, look, if you're going to aim, aim high. I get it at this point because what do you lose? I mean, you're still dealing with the same mindset, whether she's a proverbial four or she's an, a 10. Same mindset. Yeah, but the majority of men don't want to be PUAs. You know, we want a long-term relationship where we can feel like we're loved and where right. we can actually have like real intimacy, whatever the hell that's supposed to mean. Is so, that possible nowadays? Is that really possible? Well, that's what we want. It doesn't it doesn't matter like in terms yeah. of so the P PUAs will always make up a small minority of men because they're they're men that want to game the system for sex, but they don't necessarily want love. Okay. So that that that's that that's the thing. But like like all the other communities, everybody wants like the incels and the MRAs, they want love. They want stable, long-term relationship. Right. And, and a lot of the men going their own way out there, they're all kind of like, well, the unicorn is out there and I'm going to find her. And I'm like, dude, it's been five years. No unicorn. Where's the unicorn? It's like, well, she's there somewhere. Don't worry. You're going to find a unicorn too. And I'm like, no, I could find a unicorn. Even if I did find a unicorn, she turned into a cow within like a couple of years. So I'm not going to bother. Right. Like, the unicorn, it's only a disguise, right? Like it's, she's just wearing the unicorn disguise. Okay. So, but now you're over in Canada. What, yeah. What's the difference between the Canadian, because you guys have been hit hard by feminism itself, right? <laughs> what's the difference between an American and then the Canadian prospects? I mean, is it different? I mean, could be different, but based on province, what is it? Well, it's pro definitely province and city, but I mean, if you go to Montreal, even Rouge V love Montreal because the women there, are, you know, they're more slender. They're they've got a better better mood about them. Women in Ontario, they're very cold. They're 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 very like I'd say bossy. They're, this is a major place for feminism. So there's a lot of government jobs and there's a lot of you know entitlement programs and you know they all want to become teachers or nurses or you know work in some sort of like safe and secure job where they're unionized and all this kind of stuff. And that's affected the culture. Like they're, they're miserable and they're constantly challenging men, trying to put men in their place. Like, I don't want that. Like, why would I want to bother with that? Right. Again, I've been, I've been to Quebec. I've been to the Maritimes. Uh, the girls in the smaller towns around, around here are better, but if they come to the cities, they turn into the same thing. So right. that's going to happen. My, my experience from women in the States, it really depends on which state you go to. Right. I mean, uh, it just, from my travels over the last three, four years, like blue states, I did not have a good time when I was traveling and, you know, shooting different videos, red states the like the women were a lot more pleasant. Like if I would travel to, you know, like the pony express, um, uh, station in ne Nebraska, the woman I talked to, she was nice and pleasant right. where I could go to Miami. And I was, I was at wow. the sex museum there in Miami yeah. I got gaslit and I got like the runaround by one of the women that runs the, she was like, what, 25, 30 years old. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, yeah. I just want to talk to somebody so I can do an interview. And she's, oh, call back in half an hour. I call back and have, oh, call back in two hours. I call back in two hours. Oh, call back tomorrow. I'm like, oh, okay. I call back tomorrow. I'm like, what can you, can I just come by and see? No, you can't. I'm like, right. what is going on? Right. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I we experienced that because I'm in Southern California, which is basically the apex predator, uh, where where the 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 nines from Nebraska come here and they think they're going to be a nine here, they end up dropping down to a six, uh, because there's a lot of pleasantly looking people here, but because of the competitive environment, relationships are difficult. Some people have them here; they certainly do, but they, you know, our divorce rate is seventy five percent. And then you also have a lot of people who are discontent. A lot of women are discontent because they came here to be a princess, but the marketplace is so competitive here where they walk around with a massive scowl on their face as opposed to being pleasant, right? So that's, that's this like spiteful thing. And I noticed the right. same thing in Southern California. You'd have this like nasty spitefulness. Like, and it's nasty. It's, and, and I think that this is kind of a reflection. If you've got the, you've got the uh, insults on one side, and then you're getting all these women that aren't getting what they want and they're becoming really spiteful. And, yeah, and, right. and so it's like society is like polarizing against those lines. Yeah. And here, if you have a boat, if you have, a, I see what happens is what I tell is I, I kind of say it's the 90, 10 rule because the guys who have 
you know, mansions and boats and big cars, Maybachs and all kind of, uh, you know, Rolls Royce as well. You know, they clean up here. I mean, it's it's easy. Doesn't mean that, you know, they don't deal with female nature, but it's easy to get them here. Now, if you're a guy like me, I have a BMW. I have a tr I mean, I have a, a nice layout, you know, three bedroom uh, townhome. I mean, I have a, a nice layout, but here that's no good. I mean, for me, like if I was somewhere in Nebraska with this setup, I'd be decent. In Southern California, what? I mean, there's dudes that got McMansions and that are that are bringing girls to their boats. I mean, so what happens is there's very few of those guys. They run through the the top ten percent of the women. Those women are all discontent. A person like me shows up, and I say, "Hey, look at my setup," and they go, "That ain't nothing, right?" So um, they're they're disappointed in their results. They can't really lock down that top guy and they're not going to deal with guys that have less than. Yeah. So it it's a it's a crazy marketplace. But still, if everyone kind of evened it out, everybody could probably get a little bit of what they want. Well, the only reason it worked in the past was because women didn't have many options when it came to work. Right. So I look at it as, you know, women, women still want the man, but they want the man so they can take his money and they can curry favors with other women. They can use, so they use their own money for their own living expenses, right? right. So they, their own spending money, but they use the man's money to buy gifts for their friends or to buy, right. you know, to buy social capital. They take your capital and they convert it to social capital. Right. So they want a guy they know they can will always give them money so that they can buy favors with other women. So this is this is something I noticed with a lot of women. what they'll do is they will they'll act like the mafia, right? So you know they'll they'll buy their friends gifts, they'll buy the best gifts, they'll get the most you know encouragement from those friends, yeah. and then when it comes time for for them to have a hardship in their own life, they can call in those favors, and those favors are not like money in the bank. Those favors are social capital. Social capital, right, right. So, so they want a guy that they know that they will will always give them enough money to to buy that social capital. But I'm thinking though, some of the people that you're describing, some of the women, like they said, like you said, the women in Ontario, they want to be teachers, they want to be nurses. Well, for the most part, these careers aren't self sustaining careers. Like none of these careers were meant to support somebody full time, twelve months a year for a lifetime. Like some women can make a lot more money doing other things, but they, they don't want to, they typically, even though they have the opportunity to go into STEM engineering and doctor and law, they still hover into what, uh, you know, low paying jobs. And then they complain when they can't find a guy, um, that is willing to sponsor them as a husband, like what you were talking about that uh, can allow them to keep their money and then put themselves in a bad spot as a man by, you know, marrying them. Like they want to be a power couple when they make thirty five thousand dollars a year. Well, I don't think I don't think you're you're kind of aware of the financial situation here in Ontario. Like teachers make a hundred thousand dollars a year. Oh, shoot. Well, 80, 90, a hundred thousand dollars a year. Starting so, off or what? Starting off sixty, seventy thousand. Wow. I mean, man, okay, that's not happening around the country here. I mean no, but you know, nurses, same thing, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year. So again, these are government jobs. And the thing is here, the government jobs are skewed to the point where the pay is better than in the private sector. So you're starting to see all these women kind of migrate into the, the public sector, get high, high salaries. And then you get people like lawyers to starting off, they're getting like 40, $50,000 a year. Okay. So lawyer, like you're seeing this, this skewed dynamic. And then That's those awesome. lawyers, they can't, they can't get, they can't get like uh, the you know the the relationships that they want because they don't make enough money, but they have the status job. And right. then you get plumbers who have the high paying job, but it's not a high status job. That's so right. Mix mismatch in the sexual marketplace, and nobody knows what to do with it. You know, like you know, it's 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 destroying family formation. So because right. before a blue a blue collar guy could qualify just on income alone and what he can provide provision. He could qualify for a, a six or a seven, right? Not anymore. Now he's not got more. He could have 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, a blue collar guy, because he had the income, he had a, probably a, a pension or whatever it is, he could qualify. But because he works, you know, at, at the plant, he doesn't qualify in today's marketplace. Well, I, I read I read an article a while back, and it, and it was saying how women are dating down. I'm like, what do you mean a dating down? So there's a lawyer in New York. She was making something like seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year. 
and she's dating down a plumber who is making like one hundred and forty thousand dollars a year. That's considered okay. dating down. That was dating. But he made expectations by dating a man that makes more money than I do, but has a lower status, a lower career. status job. Okay, this is bullshit. Like, wow. <laughs> They, I mean, yeah. so so how are you? We can't make sense of this stuff. I well, mean, we, we really would lo- like to make sense. And when we come to, you know, I don't have a platform where women can actually talk through these things. We kind of just use what they say in, in media. But for the most part, how could they make sense of this gap? I mean, there's literally a gap uh, created it, here it, where men like us say we are going to walk. It's not just money that's the gap and hypergamy and resources. It's also the status of your education, the status of your social life. It's, it's not just like the men are competing with each other for money to get women. They're competing with each other for status. who has the most likes on their Facebook page, right. who, you know, who has the most you know prestigious career, even if it's making less money, right? right? Like you have to compete on so many levels. Like, wow. and, and guys just can't keep up with this, right? So- that's why it's just like, what's the point, right? Like, yeah, right. yeah. Let me do some super chats here. Uh, I'm a potato. Says uh, we also see non chameleon women uh, changing slowly. They are admitting that they want to be submissive and criticizing feminism for hurting a great uh, deal for them. All right, um, Matt uh, from Mankind. Shout out to you for your super chat. Our drizzle said, Coach and uh, Sandman. I appreciate your content. Great to see this collaboration. The red pill knowledge you provide is very val- valuable. Thank you for helping. Men and me, uh, I'm a potato. Says, let me know, Sandman. On that front, I will heavily invest in you and your business savvy. All right, that might be something that you can provide. There's a guy, Alex G X N. Watch at Young Men's Daily Red Pill. I had him on this channel as well. He says he covers issues from dating, feminism, MGTOW, and uh, makes content for younger guys, which is important. I mean, he, I think he's like 23, 24, 25. So he's one of the guys that are. Uh, in the marketplace for young guys. That's good. Hercules from Panthon says, CGN Sandman, this is ga- uh, galactic. Carl K says, uh, will you wind up like Japan in the urban war? Will we wind up like that? Let me go through all of these because I got like, man, am I going to catch up to these? <laughs> Everybody's in the building. We got like over 3,200 people in here. Hit the like button. Appreciate wow. you for being here. Uh, West App says, uh, appreciate the collab. What do you guys think about seminal retention, focusing on goals, using foreign women on planned vacations in lieu of U.S. women. Give me one second. We'll come back to that. JWL says, just wanted to give a shout out to my man, Donnie. He introduced me to Sandman. That led me to you, coach. Donnie learned the hard way she'll get mad and you'll go to jail. I'm a potato, says CJ and Sandman. What are your three top lifestyle choices to go full monk? I'm doing a video on that. Stoicism rather than talking about women. Let me do one more. Red Pill Mike says, Dr. Phil, has had red pill men on the show before and he basically attacks them. I would not give that purple pill simp a second of your time. He is educated, but ignorant on uh, as the day is long. So a couple of questions in there, see if we can do them quickly because uh, a couple guys talk about seminal retention. We can kind of talk about it real quick. Foreign women, seminal retention, focusing on your goals and monk mode. Okay. So start with the first one. Hello? Yep, I'm here. So start with the first one. Yep. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, the first one is uh, seminal retention. I mean, I I did that once for about a month, and yeah. I didn't notice any difference in terms of I, – I, I don't – that does, it didn't make any difference for me. I was in my early twenties. Yeah. I, I, my life was pretty much the same. My achievement was pretty much the same. The biggest change I've ever noticed was when I got out of relationships about six months, seven months after I got out of relationships, my testosterone level went back up because when you're in a long-term relationship, your testosterone level goes down. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden my testosterone level goes up. My creativity goes up. My ability yeah. to think critically goes up. Yes. And I'm like, I'm like a whole new person. So forget right. seminal retention. Focus on, you know, like staying single for six right. months and see what happens. I agree with that. So that's goals and ties into focusing on your goals. Um, because that that goal is that that go that ties in. And then what about foreign women uh traveling, passport gang, we call it. Well, I was watching um an amazing uh, video yesterday from Insulmatics, and they were talking about geomaxing, you know, and, and they were talking about one guy who, you know, he disappeared. He was like he was an incel, and then he went to Thailand and the Philippines and Ukraine, and he showed pictures of himself with all these different beautiful women. 
And then he just disappeared from the community. So they're like, I don't know if he got married or if he had a family or whatever. Okay. So the, the, uh, the, 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 that community says in terms of geo maxing, in terms of going, using your maximal potential to find foreign women, go to places like Cambodia, go to places like Thailand, go to places like Ukraine. That's, that's what, uh, that's their suggestion. Now, the other issue is you're not only competing against Western men who come there and then the people right. who, when they were local, but you're also seeing guys from Japan, from China, from Korea, now going into the Philippines to try to take the exact same women. So wow. you're starting to see guys from North America, Europe, you know, you know, like yeah, see, China, the secrets out. go to the Philippines to find these Filipinas, right? Like what the hell is going on? Right. Like, uh, like, yeah, that's going to mess up the marketplace value in Philippines. I mean, so. get go? Like now, they're now one guy was saying like they're going, they're going to the Congo to look for women. I'm like, what are you like? What are you nuts? Like, wow. you can get like your face mauled off by a by a by a gorilla over there. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I guess people got their motives right. They got their motives. They want to get it. They want to get that uh, submissive, uh, you know, feminine, nurturing woman under all conditions, right? So well, it's it, it has more to do with the fact that. You, you have such higher sexual marketplace value than she does. So she's going to stick around with you because her options right. are limited. That's what it's all about. You but know, I've watched you guys of that though, because a lot of times you guys don't understand that when you do put a woman in that position, she follows you around like a cat. All right. Um, and that might not be, that might not be something that you consider until it happens. And then you're like, Oh, I can't, I can't even go to the grocery store without it being a family trip. You got to bring her, her mother, her father, her elderly grandfather, you know what I mean? Like, I, I get it. I get it. You want uh, a woman to be in a position where she needs you and depends on you. But when you get that woman, it's a different thing. All right. And you might not be ready for it if it happens. Yeah. You'll be sending packages to the Philippines, you know, the size of like televisions, you know, boxes. <laughs> like, for like entire family. Times, you know, like they, they have a service here where like, uh, like I was dating one woman from the Philippines. And there's a guy who comes every month and there's a box. They just drops off a box. Right. And then she would throughout the month just collect stuff like free samples or she would buy like cheap stuff when she'd see it on sale. And she'd just fill the box. A month later, he'd come by, pick up the box and drop another empty box off. Mm -hmm. And you're like, what's going on here? Like, you know, and, and, and this is just normal, right? Like their, their whole idea is our export in the Philippines, our Philippines, our greatest export is – uh, are young who go overseas, collect stuff and send it back to us. Right. Like that's, that's our, that's how we run our economy. 30% of their economy, the money in their economy is all funneled back from Western countries back into the Philippines. That's how they keep their society going and becoming prosperous. Mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's, it's a very parasitic kind of thing, right? Like it's, it's, right. you know, I, I don't know, like, again, a lot of countries do the same thing, but right. You know, when you're just, when you're just gaming the system and it's, it, you know, you know, it's not a, it's not a long-term sustainable thing and their birth rates are also falling. So eventually they'll, they'll run into the same problems that the Western countries are having. Exactly. Especially. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Meg, Mega Tau, he said, I missed his first one, but I didn't. That was the question about Howard dares, but I don't know what he meant by dis dispense. I'm not, not sure. About Howard dare. Yeah. He said, um, he said, uh, any ideas on Howard Dare? Oh, disappearance? He, well, he announced that he wasn't doing any more content here. I don't know if he announced it, but like what happened? I he did. Uh, uh, yeah, after the big town. Like Howard Dare, or was it? I am I might be getting confused, but I think he said he wasn't doing any more content here. Yeah, I'm I mean, not. after the MGTOW demonetization, he just he couldn't afford to do it. There's only a few yeah. content producers that can still kind of like myself, TFM, yeah. Like and, and a few other people, like it's ironic that uh, Jerry Lou and uh, Big John, or they didn't get monetized fully. They can still make ads and make money off their channels, right? But they got everybody else demonetized. So <laughs> <laughs> the Don says, "This is crazy." The Godfather or YouTube MGTOW Sandman and the MGTOW MVP of YouTube on the same stream. The Goat Sandman and the Boat, best of all time. CGA salute. Thank you, brother, for the compliment. Brant Bates, thank you for your super, uh, live chat, uh, super chat. Adam W says, uh, "Are even are even us pragmatic, happy, emotionally independent men seeking validation by listening to the likes of CGA Sandman and the Joker, etc.? Are we seeking val? Because I think the point was made that you know PUA seek validation, incel seek validation, MRA seek validation. What about us? Are we 
seeking validation, I guess, by listening to 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 the content creators or are we replacing that? women's validation with us i think i think we're kind of going towards internal validation okay i think i think it's all about you know when i do a good job on something and i look at my you know i'll do a travel video and i'll be like job well done i i, I feel that sense of accomplishment yeah and, and i you know that's that's what i want i want that internal validation so i don't have to depend on other people to make me feel good i can make myself feel good so i don't have to you know, I don't have to be, you know, I don't have to rely on the community. That's pretty much what it comes right. down to. Okay. John Basic says, so Sam, man, remember 2010 uh, MGTOW uh, has come a long way. Only way to protect yourself. Thank you, man. Sam Aponte says, shout out to the coach game. Thank you, Sam, man. I found the red pill through you. I watch both of your gentlemen's content on a daily basis. I appreciate all that you do. Thank you, Sam. Don Julio TV says, my dad, a lawyer, told me of his new client, a chiropractor who is being extorted by an overweight black woman saying he sexually assaulted her. Hashtag run. Hmm. The steel curtain says, uh, did you have something to add to that? <laughs> no. Nah, not right. really. Yeah, <laughs> sure. The steel curtain says uh, they only try to get ad rates and blackball Sandman at the same time. The old two for one special is a trick. So they might be running ads in the background or whatever on the content and then getting paid and then giving us nothing. Age of Machine says, watch this turn into a tag team between Dr. Phil and Kathy Newman and Oprah's the special guest referee. Don't do it. If Oprah shows up on your Dr. Phil show, I mean, you might become legendary just on that basis. <laughs> well, I, I tell her all about my experience growing up in the 90s watching Oprah when I came home from high school. Yeah. <laughs> how traumatic it was. How traumatic it was. Shout out to Steph is cold. Great content creator, man. Appreciate you, man. Uh, Gerald Clay, thank you for your super chat. Crazy Pie Thief says, I listen to Sandman every night when I take a shower. No homo. <laughs> Just the perfect end of the day. Tyson Jaleel, you only have one life. Take the chance on Dr. Phil. He says it may lead to other things. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I this is it's all agenda driven. We all know that it's all. Yeah, exactly. Jay Rodriguez says two Titans of MGTOW. Thank you, Coach and Sandman. We don't hate women. It's that women in the government have weaponized relationships. We are just logical. Great point. And then uh, and MegaTow says you got it. Thanks, Roy. War, uh, Word Law says thanks, fellas. The game is very appreciated. Appreciate you, man. Futuristic Dreamer. The real reason divorce is up is because men do manual labor jobs more and are out of work during the lockdown women do clerical office job work which means they are they can be done from home so they're just making money while their man isn't that could be true one. true vent z says hey man if you think uh sex robots will satisfy men you un don't understand human nature what would you say about that okay i understand it because i've had two two of those samples sent to me mm -hmm. and i understand the first time I used that technology, the, 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 like just the dolls, regular dolls, it was satisfying. Second, third time, it wasn't. So I thought to myself, what could I do to make this technology more satisfying? Number one, you need a way to put, project another person into it Got and make them part of the experience. Because right. if you can do that, then it's not a robot. You're interacting with another human being through oh, another human being in the, okay, wow. That's, that's the next level. So it, it, I don't know if you've ever seen that. Uh, the best example would be that show, or that, that film Surrogates. I don't know if you've okay. ever seen it with, with um, Bruce Willis. Okay. Where humans, they, 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 they stay in their homes, but they go out and they project their consciousness into a robot. And, and then the robot kind of walks around in society. So the society, there are no people on the society. It's all robots. All the people are sitting at home in their underwear. And, and the robots are wandering around like, and they all look perfect. Like they're 20, 25 years old. And whatever that robot experience is, you experience as well. So, well, we're almost there. We're halfway there now. Well, we we want. We, well, you know what scares me? Uh, Elon Musk said he he's connected Neuralink to a pig. I okay. saw that. Saw that. What did what how, what happened with that? I only saw a little clip on Instagram that he put a chip in the pig. And what wow. did the pig do? What did the pig do? What did it do? I don't know. I'm just asking oh, you. I don't know. I don't know. But I think. The whole idea was that uh, he believes humans can be implanted with this chip at some point. Well, everyone's so scared of AI coming out. I'm more worried about what if what if he networked like 50 pigs, right? And all of a sudden, these 50 pigs had a neural net that was more intelligent. And all of a sudden, the 50 pigs became super intelligent because they could network their brain. 
right? And then all of a sudden the pigs figured out they were eating them. And it'll be like a pig revolt or something. Like the, the Borg pig. Can you imagine a B Borg pigs taking over the world, right? Like just some ridiculous thing like that. Forget AI. Like right. this, this idea of networking brains, like imagine you, me, and like 10 other guys, we networked our brains. Right. We could solve all kinds of problems that we wouldn't be able to do individually, but we would lose our individuality in the process. Hence yeah. the Borg. That's why I don't like this technology. I, I'm more worried about this than I am about AI. Well, the, if you think about it, most of the people that they could, let's say they could chip people and then influence them, they probably be better than 70% of the Americans sucking air right now, right? I mean, if you did this longer term, there's a lot of people here that are just uh, sitting around waiting for crumbs. They, they don't really produce anything. So you could make them more advanced at least than 70, 50, 30% of people here that are sucking wind right now. I mean, that's just the idea that I have here. Um, let me see. Megatile says, uh, go into Canada and find me a unicow. 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 Because <laughs> we were talking about unicorns. The unicorn, yeah. He's got the unicow out there in Canada. I mean, I don't know how far north you got to go to get something like that. Well, careful. You'll get eaten by a polar bear. Oh, yeah. They don't want that. Uh, Jay Rodriguez says, the unicow. Corn is a cow in disguise. That's Sandman's quote right there. Jarrell Boston says $200 in a boat. Who got it? Yeah. Oh, that was the uh, girl that I put on my live stream. She was saying that uh, she was looking for a sugar daddy for $200 a week in a boat. All right. We what? Well, how big does the boat have to be? Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll jump aboard, sailor. You, all you need is a dinghy or something and you're good. All right. Andrew Jackson. Hey, Sandman, I got a question for you. Have you heard of a holiday brand called uh, Catherine's Collection? They make life-size, realistic human holiday dolls, and I collect them. Good luck on your uh, doll, Sandman. Thanks, Coach G. Catherine's collection. I have I haven't heard of that. And the thing is, it's like I can't call it a doll. Like this is everyone's assuming it's right. like a doll or a robot, and I'm like, no, it, you have to look at it as something completely different. You have to look at it as a way to have virtual sex through the internet with another person. Mm. And yeah, that's the idea is. My idea now is to market it to women first. So to basically say, this, do it. this is the doll. This is the technology to replace. We, we know men have these dolls, but this is for women. And then that way I can, I can sell the male versions of the dolls to women. But on the other, on the back end of the website, I can sell the female versions to the men. Mm -hmm. Right. And that way mm -hmm. I've got the cover. So if they ask, well, you, how come you're selling these dolls to men? I go, no, 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 no. This is a company for women first. We we promote these dolls for women. And if you visit our website, you'll see clearly that those are the dolls that are on display and those are the dolls we're selling. So they can't they can't say, well, this isn't fair. You're 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 a misogynist. It's like, well, well, look, 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 look. This is for women. You know, and I, you can take this technology, you can go to women's shows, you can promote it in places where you would never get away promoting a doll for men. You could open a, a, a brothel for women. Hell, it wouldn't even have to be successful. And then you, you know, you could have a couple rooms for men in the brothel. Those rooms would always be busy. But when people ask, this is a brothel for women. For women, the, 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 it's like they'll, they'll, they'll jump on that. They already they already do this, by the way. What? I mean, they just don't know it. I mean, not to the level that you're trying to get, but they already have their toy collection and it's totally fine, right? Well, what I'm building a toy, a toy that they can't a toy that's gonna create um like in, like it's going to create validation on a whole other level for them. Right. For sure. Yeah, for sure. They'll, they'll do that. They'll sign up. Uh, we'll get, we'll, we'll wait on that technology from you. Counselor Murray says, Sam, man, Bezos on the beat says women, uh, they act like the mafia. That's a quote from you, Sam, man. Amos Brown says, coach and Sam, man, this is a classic matchup. Thank you guys. Achilles last stand down to the last two super chats. A and a radio says legendary collaboration. You two have inspired me. Inspire men such as myself to become better versions of ourselves. Keep it up, guys. And then shout out to my man, Brant Bates. I did a lot of reading this one towards the end. I don't think he says anything, but I don't I can't see. Man, we made it to the two hour mark. Uh, listen, man, if you would have told me again, content creators, this is for you. September 2018 is when I made a commitment. 90 days to do this content and do it to see if I can build an audience. Never thought I would interview Sandman. Never thought I would interview Alpha Mill Strategies and all of the likes of men that I've been watching for years. And I just had an opportunity to spend time with the legend. All right. If the Mount Rushmore of the Red Pill came out, you definitely would be that guy. 
on there, one of the guys on there. Anything that you want to leave these guys, these 3,000 people that came in here and hit the like button, came in here, anything that you want to leave them with, maybe tell them how to find any of the things that you have coming up? I mean, they can they can find me on YouTube, but uh, just just don't just be careful of uh, uh, the bulldog mindset. He seems to have monopolized all the searches for MGTOW. So. Oh, well, he's got a good creation over there. Um, <laughs> what does it happen? Uh, they can't find you if they if they do that. Well, if I if I if they just search for Sandman, let's see what happens on on YouTube. Uh, I will pop up. I, I pop up. That's good. So. Oh, they, probably, yeah, I mean, I think you had it for a long time. You had it for a long time. If you just well, I, I had, I had a lot of anger too because uh, I would, I would post. I have back then it was only twenty results per page, and I had something like ten or fifteen of the results out of twenty. So when people would search for MGTOW, they would just find my channel and then occasion because I was putting out videos every day, right? So the That's the right. algorithm was rewarding me with that, right? But now you get like the bulldog mindset if you do a search for MGTOW, and it's all it is is. You know, let me see if oh, I anti. He's going. He's speaking against. Yeah, it. yeah, that's more of the throttling. Yeah, if I if I just did a search for me, I don't see my my own channel until you go down like ten results. Interesting. Okay, all it's right. High big tail videos up until that point. Well, this this is definitely a niche. All right, for people to come out against it. I mean, I don't. I think what happens is when they do, all they bring is the MGTOW guys over to roast whatever they post, and it gets ratioed. So I don't know how successful it is for them to do that, but. It's a niche. Exactly. Thank you, man. I appreciate you for being here. Hang tight as I uh, close the show and now we'll chat off uh, line real quick. Thank you, brothers, for being here. Thank you for being here for another legendary collaboration. We're going to be back in here tomorrow for the call in show. All right. Where we'll talk about something specific. I'll make it up right before I go on. We'll be on at about 545 p.m. Thanks once again. And then everybody say, Hi, everyone. It's Sandman here. All right. Everybody say that. Enjoy the rest of your day and cheers. You got to love that, man. All right, man. Shout out to everybody, man. We're going to be out. If you want to get your hands on this Thought Tears mug, then visit my Teespring store down in the description. You can also get your hands on the Cure for Feminism t-shirt and classic tank top. If someone doesn't like it, then you can ask them if they're being Islamophobic. I also have a Sandman t-shirt and 25% of the sales proceeds go to the artist as well as the classic Sandman sticker and mug. You can also get the entire Sandman collection through digital download or USB key if you want through email. Those are the sound files for the first five seasons of my channel, so you can have those to take on the go. Each season is 15 US dollars. Finally, you can also talk to me via one-on-one -on -one coaching through Skype for only $45 an hour. My contact email and Teespring shop are the first links down in the description.